So now we're going to go over the categories of chemical sedimentary rocks and how they form. So we have evaporites. Those are ions in seawater bonding together and crystallizing and then falling to the seafloor. For example, sodium and chloride can crystallize and form rock salt, and they crystallize from salt water. From salt water. Chemical residues such as iron oxide or rust results, it's a result of weathering of iron rich minerals. For example, mafic minerals, which are iron rich, such as minerals in the igneous rock basalt. Oxidation occurs in terrestrial water bodies like lakes and rivers where the water contains dissolved oxygen. And then third, we have biochemical sedimentary rocks like coal, limestone, and chalk, and we will discuss those later. So then I have this video on how salt crystals form. Hi, I'm going to show you a demonstration on salt evaporite minerals. First, I will take some salt and pour it into my little dish. I'll put in a lot. Then I am going to pour in some warm water just because it'll dissolve a little bit better. And then I will mix it. Okay, so it took a few minutes, maybe about three minutes, it took to um, fully dissolve all the salt. So now what I'm going to do is just leave this aside and the water is going to evaporate out of the dish and the dissolved salt ions are going to bond back together as they are no longer able to be dissolved in the water as the water evaporates. It's going to leave behind salt crystals at the bottom of the dish, just like salt evaporite minerals in a sea that has a high evaporation rate. So we will come back and see in a couple of days what happens. This is day two and there are no crystals yet. This is day three, and it looks like there's a couple of pieces of white in there, although I'm not sure if that's dust that fell in there or if that's crystallization. I'm starting to see a little tiny bit of flecks of material. You can see, like on the side there. Not Okay, so we'll check back tomorrow and we'll probably see more crystallization. So today is day five and you can see that there is some crystallization that has happened. These little white pieces that have started to form in here. So here we have it a little bit more of a close up and you can see the crystals are actually formed in a little cube shaped. So that's because of the crystal structure of salt. It's cubic. So you got little, little tiny cubes. You know, this is about an hour later and you see a whole lot more crystallization has happened. Okay, so this is just a little bit later, maybe a couple hours later. Start to see even more crystallization has happened. So also if we look closer, you can see that some of the salt crystals have settled to the bottom. So that's what happens in the sea as well. 
you know, the salt crystals, which are heavy, and they start to fall to the bottom after they form. Day six, you see a lot more crystals in there. This is day seven. Look how many crystals there are in here. And give it up the side. climbed up the side of the glass and then formed around the rim. This is day eight. There's a little bit of water left, but for the most part, it is gone. And you can see the salt crystals have climbed up the sides of the glass, and there's a whole bunch of salt crystals at the bottom of the Petri dish as well. Day 9, and this concludes the experiment. Thank you for watching. Okay. So, what is happening there is this. So, you have a body of salt water, for example, the Dead Sea, and you have lots of ions dissolved in the water. And those ions come from chemical weathering of minerals, as we discussed the other day. And then if you were to have a lot of the water evaporate out, you're leaving the ions behind because they're too heavy to evaporate out. So then the remaining seawater has a higher concentration of ions. And then at some point, the water can't hold any more ions dissolved and the water is saturated with ions. We'll just add in the solution. And when we talk about solution, we're talking about like the dissolved salt. The salt water is a, it, salt water is a solution. Okay, and then when there were too many ions, to stay dissolved in the water, some are gonna come out of solution, which means they become solid particles again, and they bond together, and then those crystals are heavy, so they fall to the bottom. And then you get a layer of rock salt at the seafloor. And here's, ex here's um, some little cubes at the coastline of the Dead Sea. You have some cubes of salt crystals. And it's a constant process of dissolving and forming. So some of these crystals are then going to dissolve again as you have crystals that form and then you have them dissolve and then they form. So it's, it's just a process depending on how much water is in the sea versus how many ions. And then this is just a diagram showing a similar situation. You have a warm climate with high amounts of evaporation. You're going to get your salt, uh, layers of salt forming. This is a rocky area in Orchard Beach in the Bronx. And there's like this area of the rock that forms puddles where there the rock area is exposed at low tide but you have some water that's left behind from high tide so you get these little tiny puddles and then as the seawater evaporates it leaves salt crystals behind that's pretty cool little salt crystals in there oops so here are some examples of chemical sedimentary rocks. And chemical sedimentary rocks are classified mainly based on their composition. So we have carbonate rocks, which mean they contain limestone or dolostone. Dolostone is similar to limestone. 
So limestone consists primarily of minerals containing carbonate or CO3. The mineral name of calcium carbonate is calcite. Other chemical sedimentary rocks include halite or rock salt, which contains the mineral halite, rock gypsum, and chert. Chert is a type of rock that's made of quartz. So that's chert, that's rock gypsum. Then we have chemical residues or rusting or oxidation that's related to iron in mafic minerals. Examples are limonite and hematite, and that's um, the basalt that I showed you earlier. I can show you that again. Then we have biochemical sedimentary rocks, coal, limestone is also in this category, and then chert. Sometimes chert can also be a chemical sedimentary rock. It's not always biochemical. So coal is a biochemical sedimentary rock composed largely of land plant remains. It forms in, ocean, in oxygen deficient swamps or bogs. So here's a photo of a bog. A bog is a wetland that has accumulated dead plant material. And partially decayed vegetation that was buried and compressed. So you have these plant material that gets does, uh, deposited in the swamps and bogs, it does not get decayed completely, and then it gets buried at the bottom of the lake, uh, the swamp, the bog, it gets compressed, and over time it turns into coal, which is in this photo. This is what coal looks like. And it goes through the same compression, similar to how clay forms that we talked about the other day. Okay, so you have burial of this plant material. The plant material initially is called peat. It's partially altered. And then it gets compacted and buried further and it turns into lignite, which is a little bit more solid. And then eventually more burial and a little bit of heat and you get bituminous coal. Now, anthracite coal is actually metamorphic, which we'll talk about when we do the metamorphic chapter. So now we're going to go through the whole category of carbonate rocks or sedimentary rocks made of calcium carbonate or CaCO3. The mineral is called calcite. Okay, so those are your limestone rocks. And again, these are bioclastic. Coquina is a type of limestone composed of broken seashells that are cemented together. So a close-up of coquina shows you little pieces of seashells, okay? And that would be related to, let's say, the coast, uh, the ocean coast, where there's seashells that get broken up. Eventually, those can get cemented together. You don't really have too much compaction here. It's more cementation, getting those seashells to stick together. Then we have chalk. Chalk is composed of tiny shells of organisms called coccolithophores that live in the ocean. Their shells are made of calcium carbonate. So here is a highly magnified image of coccolithophore. When these and when these organisms die, their shells fall to the ocean floor where they undergo a lithification process. For example, mainly compaction. And then they become rock. So for example, the White Cliffs of Dover, which is here on the coast of the United Kingdom, um, the chalk, this is all chalk, okay? Like the, the, the 
the rock there is chalk. And that's related to a shallow sea that existed there 70 million years ago. And in that ancient sea, you had coccolithophores, and then those, when they died, the shells went to the bottom of that sea and formed this chalk, which, which now is exposed at the surface. And you could see it. Okay, so chalk is made of seashells. Very, very tiny though. Okay, then we have limestone that forms from coral reefs. Corals live in communities and their calcite skeletons create coral reefs. And this leads to the formation of a, a type of limestone. Okay, so this is a coral reef, and then when the corals die, they leave their skeletons behind, and they're all like living together in a community. So you have all of these areas of just lots of coral skeletons kind of, you know, next to each other. And those form reefs, which is a lime, it's a type of limestone. So that's biochemical related to living organisms. Then we have chert. Chert is a hard, compact rock made of crypto crystalline quartz or microcrystalline, which means you can't really see the crystals. It's very tiny. So examples of chert include flint, agate, and jasper. So they're all the same thing. It's just jasper is red. Agate has bands of color. And flint is black. Chert forms from layers of shells of tiny organisms called plankton. You have different types of plankton, radiolarians and diatoms, and they're deposited at the ocean floor after they die. And their shells are composed of silica, which is SiO2, which we call siliceous. Okay, they have siliceous shells. So here is a diatom, and here's some radial area. Now chert can also form just as a chemical evaporate mineral from dissolved silica in solution. But mostly chert is going to be biochemical. So again, I just wanted to show you some more photos. So these on the left are radiolarians and on the right, they're diatoms. And their shells are very intricate and very interesting looking. And these are tiny microscopic organisms. So tiny protozoa in the oceans are called plankton. And then these are types of plankton. But it's amazing how these tiny microscopic organisms have such intricate shells, right? It's pretty interesting. Okay, so then we're going to get into depositional environments of sedimentary rocks. So how do we determine the environment or the setting that rocks formed in? So we examine the rock's properties. We look at fossils, if there are any. We look at different properties of the rock layers, which are called beds or strata like the actual rock layers are what's called beds or strata. We look at the sedimentary features like ripple marks and mud cracks. We can also look at the color of the sediments because the presence of organic matter or we can look for oxidation of iron rich minerals. Okay, so the presence of organic matter is going to give one type of color the oxidation of iron-rich minerals will give you a different color. Then we can look at the grain size or the roundness of the clasts. For example, if you were to find a rock made up of broken seashells, where would you assume the rock was formed? So you could 
write in the chat if you would like. If a rock was made of broken seashells, where would you assume the rock was formed? Or you could unmute yourself. Wait, hold on. Can you say that again? Like, if it's made of broken seashells, it's got to be, like, either from the sea or, the or like, the beach. Okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah. So, if it were, let's say, that coquina rock and you see broken shells, yeah, you could link that back to your experiences that you have seen broken shells at the beach or related to the ocean. Okay, so that's good. So, that's basically what you're doing. You're looking at the properties of the rock and linking it to possible environments where the rock formed. So where do sediments accumulate? We have lakes, oceans, deltas, things like that. So we can expect different types of sediments in each depositional environment. So for example, a beach, you would find sand and broken shells. A lake, you would find clay. So here are different depositional environments. The words labeled in red are continental or land or terrestrial, all interchangeable words. So we have streams, lakes, sand dunes. The blue words are transitional, meaning they're near the coastline. So that's the beach, the delta, and then marine or ocean is labeled in black. So deep marine, continental shelf, barrier island. And then here's just another diagram showing different examples of environments where different types of sediments are gonna be found. So like a desert, sand dunes, lakes, beaches, you're gonna have, in glaciers, you're gonna have different types of sedimentary rocks. Now the word fluvial means river, by the way. Okay, so we'll add that here, river. So detrital sediments and sedimentary rocks are usually found as sedimentary beds. And again, those are called strata as well. So this is a photo from Ithaca, New York, which is like upstate New York. And you see rock layers and they're flat. Okay, so those are beds. Now these rock layers formed in an ancient sea that covered New York State at one point. So sediments are most commonly deposited in flat layers because usually they're deposited in bodies of water. Sedimentary rocks typically are going to form beds, basically. Okay, so these layers. Also known as strata. Okay, so strata and bedding, same thing, flat layers of sediment. And what about fossils? Fossils are clues that we could use to determine the depositional environment of, sed of sediments. Fossils can be found in sedimentary rocks because this rock type forms at the surface of the earth where organisms exist. So you don't usually find fossils in like metamorphic rocks unless it's not highly intense metamorphism, which we'll talk about in the next lecture. So fossils can help scientists determine what type of depositional environment rocks formed in. For example, these two fossils in these photos are from an area of New Jersey near the Delaware Water Gap. So these are coral fossils 
And these fossils are a clue that warm seawater covered the land at some point in the past. And we can determine that by looking at where corals live today. Now these corals are, these fossils are actually about 415 to 430 million years old. So you think about where corals are found today. So does anyone want to unmute themselves and just say where, what type of environment do you find corals in today? Like the sea. Okay. And is it generally cold water or warm water? Cold. What? Like cold. Is it cold or warm? Cold. Tropical or polar? Where would you go to see corals, like to go scuba diving and look at corals? Cold, like ocean water. Okay, but is it more like in a tropical area? Oh, like like, like the Bahamas areas? and stuff? What? Like, like, like Barbados, the Bahamas. Okay, so that's kind of warm water, right? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Okay, so that's more like tropical warm water um, in, in the Caribbean, as opposed to like the North Atlantic, which is like cold water. That's what I mean. I get what you mean now. Sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. Um, okay. So yeah, so you're saying like Barbados, for example, that's a good example. So yeah, so if you're thinking of like tropical water, like Barbados would be where you find corals. Um, and do people go to snorkel or scuba dive to look at corals? Is it like extremely deep ocean? Is it like the middle of the ocean or is it more like towards the coast? Anyone who wants to answer? Do you think you go into like the deep middle of the ocean or do you go towards the coast to see corals? The coast. Okay. Okay, so we could use this information then to figure out what the environment was at some point in this area of New Jersey. So that means the area of New Jersey that I got these photos from, which again was near the Delaware Water Gap, at some point it must have been warm water and shallow. Okay, now just looking at the photos, you don't immediately know that they're like 400 something million years old, but you do know that it's probably tropical, shallow seawater because that's where you find corals today. Okay, so you you link what you know of today, you link that and you just transfer that information like, okay, these corals must mean that there used to be shallow seawater that's tropical like the Caribbean water because that's where we find corals today. You were able to stop Mari. Okay, so that is how that is how you use fossils to help you determine the depo the depositional environment. Okay, and then we could also look at other features. So you have you have sedimentary structures that will help you determine the depositional environment. For example, is there iron oxide in the rock? So here are some rocks from Riker Hill, which is in New Jersey, and the rocks are red. All of them, they're all red. So the red color indicates oxidation, which tells us that there was water and oxygen. Now, normally that tells us it's a ter terrestrial environment, land environment, as opposed to deep ocean. Terrestrial meaning shallow lakes or streams. So iron oxide or red sedimentary rocks is usually going to tell us that it's a shallow lake or streams that the rock formed in. 
We could look at other features like sedimentary structures like mud cracks, ripple marks, or we can look at the grain shape, composition of the grains, the sorting, and the grain size, which we will get into. Okay, so here are some ripple marks in a hard solid rock. So if you ever went to this, the ocean or if you ever looked in a, a river, you may have seen that the sediment at the bottom of the water has ripple marks in it. So then if there was, let's say, a storm and you had a lot more deposition on top of those ripple marks, it preserves the ripple marks. So then later on, when it, that whole area turns into solid rock, you actually still have the ripple marks maintained in that rock. So ripple marks tell us that the sediment was deposited in a location where there was a current, for example, a river or waves, ocean waves. Okay, so this is actually hard solid rock. This is not sediment in the photo. And then we have mud cracks. Mud cracks form when mud that was previously underwater becomes exposed to the air and then it dries up and then the mud kind of contracts and then cracks. So mud cracks indicate depositional environments that include a lagoon, a floodplain, mud flats, rivers, or lakes that dry up seasonally. So here's a mud crack in the present day, and then these are rocks. So like on the left, it's just mud, like a lake that dries up in the summer, let's say, during a drought. Okay, so this is just mud, but here it's turned into a rock. This is ancient mud cracks. And like these lines here are the mud cracks, this, these lines. Okay, so you're looking at different aspects of the sedimentary rocks to determine where they formed. Now also small sediment grains like clay and silt indicate a calm, gentle, low energy depositional environment. So a rock called shale, which has clay sized grains indicates sediment deposition in lakes, deep ocean, floodplains and lagoons because those are low energy depositional environments. Large grains like sand and pebbles and even boulders indicate higher energy deposition or an area where there's strong currents. So sandstone has sand grains that's usually associated with wind transport, waves, and rivers, and ocean coastlines. Conglomerate, which has rounded pebbles, indicates that there was transport in water and that the, the sediments traveled far from their source, that's because the pebbles are rounded, which is related to abrasion. The pebble size could be related to very turbulent currents, fast moving mountain streams, or strong wave activity. Breccia has angular pebbles, which indicates a landslide or glacial transport the sediments did not travel far from their source and did not experience abrasion. Now abrasion is just when rocks are bumping into each other and it helps them to become more smooth and rounded. Okay, so that's the sediment shape, right? Here's round smooth pebbles and here's angular pebbles. Roundness is a measure of how round a clast is. Does the clast have sharp edges or a smooth surface? It's not referring to if it looks like a circle or not. Okay, so that's more, that would be called sphericity, like the measure of how spherical it is. That's a different measure, that's a different characteristic 
than roundness. So roundness, you're just looking at, are there angular pieces sticking out of the rock? Are there sharp edges or is the rock smooth? Abrasion, again, is the wearing away of rocks due to scraping and rubbing. So when pieces of rock bump into each other as they travel, let's say, down a, in a river, they're going to bump into each other. And that reduces the size and it rounds the rough edges. So again, rounded clasts are related to water, like in a river or pebbles on a beach. Also, it suggests transport far distances from far distances. So like if a pebble traveled really far from where it came from, it had more time to undergo abrasion, so it'll be more smooth. And then angular clasts are usually close to the source. They did not travel that far. And those are usually related to gravity, like landslides. Then we have, again, angular versus rounded. And you have, it's actually um, like a scale, like a spectrum that goes from angular to rounded. So then in between, you would have sub-angular, sub-rounded, and then rounded and angular. So again, angular is closer to the source. Rounded indicates it traveled far from its source. So let's just go back for a second to this here, right? So rocks fall off of the source and they just land here and stay in this pile. They're going to remain angular. But if the rocks end up in this river, they're going to travel really far. And then they end up here. So those traveled far from the source where these angular pieces stay close to the source. Okay, so these are angular and these are going to be rounded in here. And then here are some rounded sediments at the coastline. This is in Garvey's Point in Long Island. So these pebbles were all transported by water and they're all rounded. Then we have sorting. Sorting is a particle size distribution where we can look, are all of the clasts in the rock the same size or are they a mix of varying sizes? So well sorted means that the particles are all about the same size. Poorly sorted means it's a range of particle sizes within that rock. So if you look here, well sorted, they're all around the same size. Poorly sorted, it's a mix of different grain sizes within that rock. And then you have moderately sorted. So it's not as extreme. Again, this is determined as a particle size distribution. So you would look at the size of the pebbles versus the small. You look at the larger particles versus the smaller particles, and then there is a way of determining if it's moderately sorted versus poorly sorted. But for our class, we're just going to look visually and see what we think. Okay, so here you have a conglomerate, which is poorly sorted, and a sandstone, which is well sorted, because it's all sand grains that are the same size, and this is all different sizes. Now, this is a sand dune in Smith Point, New York, and it shows you well-sorted sediments. Sand dunes are well-sorted because the sand grains are the main size that's moved by the wind and then deposited. So wind transport usually results in well-sorted sediments like sand. Okay, so... It's just sand grains, all the same size. So identifying sedimentary rocks. 
we look at the grain size. For example, is it clay, silt, sand, pebbles? We look at the grain shape. Is it rounded versus angular? Clasts, not the rock itself. It's talking about the clasts that make up the rock. So if we go back to the conglomerate picture, we're looking at the grains in the rock, not the rock itself. So this pebble here looks pretty rounded. These look pretty rounded. So the clasts in this rock are rounded, not angular. Okay, so that's the green shape. Green sorting, is it well sorted or a poorly sorted rock? And the composition, the types of minerals in the rock. And when I say grain, I mean classed. They're interchangeable. So grain equals classed. So then we have a clay-sized sediment here, silt-sized, sand-sized, and gravel-sized, or pebbles. Pebbles and gravel are pretty interchangeable as terms. And then this is a chart that shows you the size range in millimeters, and then the particle name, and then the rock name, and then the photos. So these are in millimeters, right? So anything, when the rock has clasts that are greater than 256 millimeters, it contains boulders and that would be conglomerate or breccia. Also cobbles, pebbles, and granules. So like all of these sizes are part of conglomerate or breccia. Conglomerate being rounded clasts, breccia being angular. If the grains are 1 16th of a millimeter to two millimeters, that's in the sand range, and that would be a sandstone. And then 1 256th to 1 16th of a millimeter is silt, and then less than 1 256th is clay. And that would give us shale, mudstone, or siltstone. Now, by the way, mud is a mixture of silt and clay. If the rock is siltstone, that means it has silt in it. If it's a clay stone, that means it has clay size. A mudstone is silt and clay because mud is silt and clay. Okay, so then we can talk about microcrystalline versus cryptocrystalline related to chemical sedimentary rocks. So microcrystalline is when you have tiny crystals. This rock is going to feel smooth, have a shiny luster, and it's going to look sugary in appearance. So that's microcrystalline. Cryptocrystalline means you can't see the crystals. Crypt means hidden. Okay, crypt is hidden. So a rock like chert, you can't see the crystals. So that's cryptocrystalline. But the rock is going to have like a waxy appearance. It'll almost look like a candle or like a bar of soap. It does not reflect any light at all. It's just like a dull, waxy appearance. And then more chemical sedimentary rock grain size names are crystalline. So that's just visible grains. Okay, so when you're talking about chemical sediments, you're talking about microcrystalline, cryptocrystalline, or crystalline. When you're talking about clastic, your, or detrital sediments, then you're referring to it as clay, silt, sand, pebbles, things like that. Okay, so that's for detrital rocks. And then for chemical sediment, it's microcrystalline, cryptocrystalline, or crystalline. And then for mineral composition, 
These are common compositions of detrital sedimentary rocks, quartz, feldspar, and clay. And that is mainly because after all of the weathering happens on rocks, what you're left with is quartz, feldspar, and clay. Because clay comes from the chemical weathering of other minerals, quartz does not undergo chemical weathering, so it's just left as smaller pieces due to physical weathering. But you, you, you don't have chemical weathering of quartz. And then you do, in some sedimentary rocks, you do have feldspar grains. Feldspar does undergo chemical weathering, but not as quickly as other minerals. So these are the products left behind after rocks are weathered down due to physical and chemical weathering. The, what you have left over is quartz, feldspar, and clay. So you can then think about why sand on many beaches consists mainly of quartz grains. It's because most of the other minerals have been weathered and broken down or dissolved into ions. So quartz is all that remains. So when you go to, let's say, this beach in Smith Point, the sand dunes are mostly quartz grains. There were little tiny bits of garnet and little bits of magnetite and other crystal uh, mineral types, but most of the sand here is quartz. <laughs> 